Uh, it's wonderful to have you with us for the English One Year. Uh, welcome to this first semester. We don't have all of the groups online yet, but we hope that everyone will join us soon. I want to say a few words about this English course before we start. It's uh, quite a challenging course, but very interesting and very enriching, I believe. The first semester and the second one are very different. In the first semester, we're going to study literature. And it's, it's a little bit technical, and uh, it's definitely studying. In the second semester, you will become more active as students, and, um, and um, you will be able to do show booster. Uh, we have everybody with us now, I think, yes. and that's very nice. Welcome, everybody. Um, I am just uh, busy talking about the English course, and I'm saying how um, in the second semester we study things like advertisements, and you write your own poem, and things like that. So I think you will uh, enjoy that, but before we do that, we need to... Um, we need to be sure that we have got um, the basics, the tools that we need to create with. Um, right, a salt says there's no picture. Uh, I'll, I'll ask about that I'll, I'll, as soon as I can. We'll get, we'll get somebody to work on that. I'm going to share something with you right away. And um, that something is the... Uh, actual outline of the course and the study guide. Uh, can you see that now? Salt River, can you see this on the screen now? Just type in the chat. Oh, good, good. Okay, so you're with us now. That's very good. Right. So, um, as you can see, this is your uh, information, which is available on Fundo as well. I'm just going to highlight a few of the things that you need to know. Um, we start off with poetry. And uh, uh, to study poetry here, first we need to study the literary terms and uh, know how uh, poets use literary devices and so on. After the poetry, uh, we study two novels and then uh, we look at drama. And there are three prescribed plays. Uh, if you look at the, the prescribed works, let me just get that on screen. Here are the prescribed readings. Then you can see that the individual poems are available on Funda. Um, right, so what I want you to notice is that you need to go to three different places to really study these poems. You need to go to where the poem is printed, and that's available under Funda Resources. And then you also need to look at your study guide, which comments on the, um, on the poem, the background, the poet's life, uh, information like that. And uh, very importantly, you need to look at the PowerPoint presentation, which is available again under resources, but you'll see that it's a PowerPoint presentation. There are four of them. The first one is for the earlier poems, and then uh, the second one takes the next batch and so on. So when you're studying a poem, you read it, the text of the poem, and you read what we have to say in the study guide about the background information, and then you study the PowerPoint presentation with a voiceover so it's not quite a video. And uh, this will take us a long time. Unit one is about um, the, the, the terminology that you need, figures of speech and literary devices. Uh, unit 2 is the study guide about the actual poems. And as you can see, uh, assignment number 1 out of 35 marks of 100 is an analysis of a seen and an unseen poem. This is going to be done on the 19th of March. 
So you have a lot of work. You've got to start working on that. Please uh, work on all the poems and the literary devices, units one and two. And then a week before the due date on the 12th of March, this uh, post will open on Funda and you'll be able to read the actual question. But uh, what I can tell you now is that you will be studying, uh, writing about one seen and one unseen poem. That means one of the poems will be a poem that you have studied and one will be a new poem that you've never seen before. And uh, I would expect you to know a lot about the first poem and to be able to write about it really well because I would have studied it with you in the study guide and the PowerPoints. The second poem, the unseen poem, is one you've never seen before. So I won't be quite so demanding, but I would expect you to be able to see that you know how to use literary language, you can recognize figures of speech, um, and you can respond. So the 35 marks, as you can see, um, are broken down here, and the biggest <clears throat> bulk of the marks is for your knowledge of the prescribed poem, that's 15 points. <clears throat> Then you'll get 10 points for your knowledge and use of literary language in both of the poems. And another 10 marks for demonstrating that you understand this unseen poem, that you can respond to it emotionally and intellectually. So that's a lot of work to be done uh, and the deadline is the 19th of March. Then we'll go on to studying our novels. And what I have to say right now is that it's no good waiting until we are studying them to start reading them. As you know, a novel is much longer than a short story or anything like that. So um, uh, I just want to highlight, here you go, where the marker is now. Those are your two prescribed novels. The first one is called The Joys of Motherhood. It's an ironical title, and it was written by Luchi Emicheta, who is a Nigerian woman. The second prescribed novel is by Marguerite Poland. It's called Shades, which um, has two meanings. It's a bit of a pun. It, it can mean shadows and hints of meaning, anything shadowy in a literal way, and it also means the spirits of the ancestors. So two meanings there. Marguerite Poland is South African. So you've got a South African novel and an African novel to study, and please get your own copy and start reading those soon. I have put into Funda some extracts from these novels, but obviously for copyright reasons, I, I couldn't put all that much onto Funda, and it's not enough to read those extracts and then try to write the essay. Uh, you won't, you won't be able to uh, be very successful with that. So, the next um, thing I want to talk about is how I will assess this. It's thirty percent of the mark. Now, to write about a novel, and you will have a choice in, uh, on Funda, you'll see, you need to write at least a thousand words. Um, on the poems, you can write just 500 words on each poem, so it's also a thousand words, but when you're writing about a novel, you will write a thousand to one thousand two hundred words. Okay, this is due on the 16th of April, and it will open one week before that. I think that's the 9th of April, isn't it? And this is how it will be assessed. Ten marks each, again, for literary language. So you're constantly needing to show that you have studied Unit 1. The second ten marks are for your knowledge of the novel you have chosen, either Joys of Motherhood or Shades. <clears throat> and finally, your understanding and insight. 
Now, as you know, when you are writing an, an essay, an academic essay, it's a very good thing if you can show that you have used resources, you found books about these books, you have found reviews. Uh, many people believe a book is the best source, but that is changing. There are some fabulous uh, things available on the internet. So if you do find something good on the internet, that's good, you can use it, but just never use anything without giving it full credit in your essay, both in line and in the bibliography. Okay? Please remember that you can always, here yeah, you are, you can look in JSTOR for, for very good quality journal articles. You can do a general Google search uh, and you can find uh, things in the libraries as well to help you with your analysis. And that, uh, that is true of the novels as well as um, the, the plays. Okay? Um, when I give you marks for understanding and insight here, then I'm looking for your own personal response. Uh, don't try to pass off the reviewer's response as your own because I will catch you in half a minute, you know. <laughs> I know you won't really do that. Yeah, um, give credit to them. It's a very good thing if you can show me that you know what they said, but I want to know what you say. I'm really interested in your own response and your own opinion. Right. Um, then, the, the last assignment is what we call a comparative essay. You will be given choices um, and you will have to compare two of the three plays. So you can't take a chance and just study one play, that's for sure. But um, a comparative essay means that you show that you know both of the plays and you can see where you can compare and contrast them. What have the authors done, the playwrights done that, that is the same in their approach and what is very different? Uh, as you can see in the marking, you get 15 marks each for your understanding and insight of each of the two plays. And then there are another five marks, making 35, for the literary language once again. Right. This um, assignment is also 1,000 to 1,200 words. It's due on the 14th of May. The questions will open on the 7th of May. By that time, you should have studied all three of the plays well enough so that you can just see, okay, this is the question I like, I'm going to choose this one, and you've got a week to, to get it written up. It's far too late to start reading and looking for references then. Okay, great. Now, um, in the uh, module schedule, you'll see that I have got dates for tutorials. And I am going to take down this and change them because this, this tutorial, for instance, was not scheduled. Uh, we had to make changes to accommodate everyone. So I will fix that. I will see you again in two weeks' time. Okay? So we won't have um, a tutorial next week this time, but we will have one in two weeks' time. That's good. Thank you so much. Right. And um, now we're going to go on and do something different. I just want to put something else up here. Hmm. Right, let's start by actually studying a poem. I think we've done enough talking about literary terms and things. Let's Let's get our teeth into, into this poem. It was written by George Herbert, and it's called Love. George Herbert lived, as you can see, from 1593 to 1633. Uh, and although it was written in the 16th century, or early 17th, this poem uh, seems remarkably clear and straightforward to modern listeners, readers, because 
he was one of the metaphysicals. And the group of poets that we nicknamed the metaphysicals were very interested in science. Remember, this is the age when uh, people in Europe were starting to uh, travel around the globe in their ships and discover uh, how big the world really was, and uh, they were interested in every kind of science. So they rebelled against the frilly, flowery language of poetry that had been written before them, and they preferred to write in a very clear, straightforward way. At the time that they were living, their poetry was considered to be rather crude because it was too easy and too straightforward. But to us, it's refreshingly clear and simple. And what I like about it is that it is simple, but it is absolutely not insipid. It is deep. And I think that's the best kind of writing. If you can be profound without being obscure, then you've really achieved something. So, let me read this poem with you. Uh, Love by George Herbert. Love bade me welcome, yet my soul drew back, guilty of dust and sin. But quick-eyed love, observing me grow slack from my first entrance in, drew nearer to me sweetly questioning if I lacked anything. A guest, I answered, worthy to be here. Love said, you shall be he. I, the unkind, ungrateful, ah, oh, my dear, I cannot look on thee. Love took my hand and smiling did reply, who made the eyes but I? Truth, Lord, but I have marred them. Let my shame go where it doth deserve. And know you not, says love, who bore the blame? My dear, then I will serve. You must sit down, says love, and taste my meat. So I did sit and eat. Right, now, as I'm sure you've realized, uh, this poem is about God, and God is love, so love is personified. He is like a person, and in fact, he is the host of this feast. And that is definitely a pun that is carried throughout the whole poem, because he is the host of the communion feast, and he is inviting this person to taste his meat. So we are dealing here with uh, deep questions of Christianity. When you are going to analyze a poem, it's a good thing to ask yourself now, how do I start and what is expected of me? And one of the first things you need to do is to ask yourself, can I say in one sentence what this poem is about? And I'm going to talk about the poem, and afterwards, I'm going to ask each group, each of you, to say in one sentence what this poem is about. If you can do that, you've probably got the theme of the poem. And that's how you start. You give the theme, you say what it's about. And then you explore the writer's feelings you can feel what he was feeling and you, you have to ask yourself how, where, in which line does he communicate this feeling and, and these ideas as well. And finally, you can go line by line looking for uh, the devices he's used and the way he has succeeded in conveying what he wanted to. So, remember what I said? You're thinking about a single sentence that can describe what this poem is about. And I'm going to go through it in detail now. Love or God welcomed me himself. And yet my soul drew back because I felt so dirty, so sinful. I have to say something about this my. The poet talks about 
mind talks, talks about I, and you mustn't make the mistake of saying that this I, this person, is George Herbert. You cannot assume that the author is writing about himself. He is using what we call a persona. Uh, it is the person who seems to be speaking, um, somebody we, we often say who is wearing a mask. So the persona feels guilty and, and hangs back, but love is very quick to see from the moment that the persona entered the, the place, the venue for this feast, that he was growing slack and that he was drawing back. So love, or God, came up to the persona and sweetly asked him, what he needed. So you can see that God is personified as a very gentle and loving host. The answer that the persona gives is that he says he's unworthy to be there. Be there. He says what I lack is being a guest worthy to be here. So love, or oh God answers, but you are the one I invited. You shall be the worthy one. And still the persona, knowing himself, says, but I can be so unkind, so ungrateful. And he talks to God and says, ah, oh, my dear, now that does sound a little strange to our modern ears, but in those days it really just meant, I love you, God, but um, I, I, I cannot look at you, it's overwhelming, this is too much. And God's response is to take the hand of the persona, to smile and to say, why shouldn't you look at me? I made your eyes. And the persona, deeply touched, says, yes, that is true, God, but I have marred them. I have spoiled them with sin. And this word Lord is important because it's the first time that he does firmly tell us what we have suspected, and that is that Lord and love are the same person. And the persona says, leave me to go where my sin and my shame deserve to be, which is not in your presence. But God has another answer, and he says, but don't you know who has already borne the blame for your sinfulness? And of course the answer to that is Christ, and the persona realizes this. And then what he says is, in that case, I will serve. I will, I will sit at this table as a servant. But God does not accept him in the role of a servant. He says, you must sit down, says love and taste my meat. So he's a full and honored guest, and he says, so I did sit and eat. And that means I ate the forgiveness, the grace, everything that God was offering me uh, in that feast. And the final line consists of a few very ordinary words, one syllable each word. And yet it's so profound and so deeply touching when you understand what the whole film is, what the whole <laughs> poem is about, sorry. Okay, so it's time for you to say something. Uh, I'm going to ask, let me see the groups here. Uh, uh, let's go to Wooster, first of all. Wooster, can you unmute your mic and talk to us or else just write in the chat? Uh, what do you think this poem is about? One sentence and see if you can get the theme. Don't be shy. I'm going to mute my mic now so you can talk.
Um, Worcester, if you are talking, we can't hear you. Have you unmuted your mic? Not your head. Not your head. Not your head. Not your head. Can you hear? Yes. yes. Okay. I think this song is about love, the way um, a sinner comes to himself and gets about saved by the grace of God and has no forgiveness for his sins and the, the way that uh, God explains to him that. He cannot bear his own blames, but the cross has given forgiveness. That's all. Yes, that's a very good answer. Thank you so much. It was more than one sentence, and with a little bit of practice, you could get that all into one sentence. Uh, you've absolutely hit the nail on the head. You've got the essence of that correct. So congratulations to you. Good. Um, now, uh, the other Vista group, um, I'm going to uh, mute my mic, and it's, it's your turn now. Uh, not uh, Vista City Church, the other Vista group, okay? Unmute your mic and uh, talk to us. Thank you. Uh, it seems as though there, there might be a problem there, so we're going to the Salt River group now. Unmute your mic, please, and tell us what you think. Um, can you guys hear us? Um, this poem is about love that accepts and forgives all. That's what we came up with. Uh, say that one more time, please. We say that this poem is about love that accepts and forgives all. Yes, that's very good. Uh, congratulations. That's fine. And it's one sentence. So well done. You can mute your mic again. And um, which group is Doxa? Is that uh, well, no, Brooklyn. Brooklyn, Doxa. Please unmute your mic and talk to us. Thank you. Ah, good idea. You've typed it in. Yes, the persona felt unaccepted and unworthy of this love, yet love drew him in. Okay, right, fine. I see, I see. No, it's fine to use the chat. Don't worry about the mic if it's difficult. Yes, um, I would have liked you to say that love is God, that it's the same thing. And it's, it's also very good. That's the theme. And I would have also added the fact uh, that uh, the element of forgiveness, uh, but you, you hint at it by saying love dreaming. Well done, yes. So it is a conversation in which God is reassuring uh, a, a sinner, a human being, that his love is there for him. Okay, well done, everybody. Great. I'm going to. Um, I'm going to start looking at our. Okay, I'm going to now look at uh, uh, something else for us. Uh, we're going to start looking at the at the actual study guide. Okay, I'm going to have to log back on to get into that, so just give us one minute. Uh, one minute, sorry about that.
Uh, okay, right, um, Doxa Brooklyn. Uh, I see your question. You know, if you really are desperately short of time, uh, I can't stop you from choosing one of the two novels uh, because you have got a choice of questions and you will be able to write on only one of them. Um, officially, they are both prescribed and I would love you to read them both because they're wonderful and they're interesting. So if you possibly can, please read them both. But if you're desperate for a shortcut, well, that is a shortcut you can take. You can't do that with the plays, as I mentioned, because of, of the comparative questions, right? So you need to study all your poems and all your plays, but when it comes to the novels, uh, you won't be sunk if you only have time to do to read one of them. That is true. Okay, great. Right. Now we are going to have a look at um, a video. Uh, I'm not quite sure about the sound effects. Uh, it is possible that you won't hear the audio part of it. So please just make a note. You've got a, a piece of paper there and a pen. Make a note of what, in this case it's hyperbole, you see? So you say hyperbole, and while the song is playing, they will actually write down in the middle of the song the words that are an example of a hyperbole. And I'll talk about them afterwards, and then we'll do an exercise to see if you can identify other hyperboles and so on. Right? Uh, if, you, if you want to hear the, the, the songs, and they're, they're nice modern songs with these literary devices in them, I chose them because I thought you'd enjoy them, then uh, it's right there in your study guide. It's embedded. You can go and listen to it. Please do that. Okay. Sounds really soft to me. Can they see me drinking my This is 
So as I said, please go and listen to those again if, you, if, if the audio wasn't good, but uh, I, I, I'll just quickly run through them. The first one was hyperbole. You pronounce that last E, of course, and it's a kind of exaggeration Usher was singing about being worth his weight in gold. And uh, well, that's, that's a bit overstated. Not many people could, uh, could get someone to pay them their weight in gold. And uh, an onomatopoeia is a device in which the words you use sound like the thing you're describing. So when she says boom, boom, pow, she's talking about the beating of her heart, things like that, uh, that she feels when, when she's in love. An idiom is a way of saying something which makes no sense when you look at the words literally, but every native speaker knows what you mean. So I, I wrote that in the, ch uh, in the chat, if you talk about the creme de la crop, which is the de la in French means of the, then it means you're talking about the cream of the crop, the best of the best. And there were a few idioms in that song, cherry on the top, if you break the bank, uh, it, it doesn't mean you break the bank literally, of course, so those are idioms. And then there was metaphor. Now, a metaphor is subtle and it might be the most important literary device of all because it's, it's really uh, very, very uh, evocative. What you do is you, you, you're actually comparing two things without admitting that you're comparing them. You just call something by another name. And uh, this was a very beautiful example of a metaphor. Your voice was the soundtrack of my summer. Now everybody knows that a summer doesn't have a soundtrack, but we know what he means when he says that her voice was like his theme song that whole summer. And it's a very loving thing to say. Right, uh, then puns. When you use a pun, you are playing with the two meanings of a word. So they sound exactly the same, but uh, they have two different meanings. And in this little one, you remember that the little bee said he was looking sharp, and it was because he had sharpened his tail, quite literally. But <laughs> it actually means uh, looking good and ready for action. And also, uh, another pun was that a perfect report card for a B is not all A's, it's all B's. And that's the two meanings of the word, of the letter and word B. Number six was alliteration, and that is the repetition of consonants. 
In this case, they're double consonants, GR. He kept singing about where the green grass grows. So that GR combination is repeated to form a very poetic alliteration. Then there is the well-known device, personification. And it means when you make a person out of something that isn't a person, you personify it. In this case, we had beauty and the beast, and the beast is treated as though he could speak and be a host and be human. Okay, then we get to simile. Again, you pronounce that final E. Uh, these words come from the Greek, and so we don't pronounce them in the English-looking way. A simile is a, is a direct comparison, so you really do use the word like. In the song it was like a battlefield, or it can be as sweet as honey. That's also a simile. And the last one was an illusion. Uh, it's spelt with an A, so be careful. It comes from the verb to allude, which means to refer to something. And um, when you use allude, you are referring to something famous, and you expect everyone to know about this, as they did in the song when they sang about Romeo and Juliet. Um, everybody knows about those famous lovers. So do not uh, uh, mix it up with the word illusion, which is a false idea that people cling to. Great. Now we're coming to the part um, where you uh, can answer some questions. Exercise one. Uh, what I have here are either definitions or examples of these nine figures of speech that you have just looked at, and I'm sure you're already familiar with some of them. I would be very happy if you could identify them. So let's go through them one by one, and uh, just write on the chat if you know the answer. Uh, I'd be very happy to see which groups know. Number one, this device is woven into the fabric of language. What's that? It is, it is rather subtle. I told you it's a very important figure of speech. Who's going to write something in the chat? Anyone? No? Oh, yes. Good, good, good. Right. Um, Doxa, can you write, please, on the chat? Uh, it's a metaphor. Well done. Excellent. Yes. Good for you. Uh, so we started with the most difficult one, and somebody got it, so that makes me very happy. Can you see that? They are actually comparing fabric and language. And they say that fabrics have threads woven in them, and language has metaphors woven into it. Great. Number two. In Hamlet, uh, Shakespeare's play, uh, a character says he will drown the stage in tears. Do you think that's literally possible? Anybody? Come on, let's have Saltrober or one of the other groups. But it's open. Anybody? Worcester? Write your answer. Brooklyn, are you going to try again? Hyperbole, that's right. Yes, it's a hyperbole because it's an overstatement, it's an exaggeration. Nobody can cry enough tears to drown a stage. Right. The next one I think is a little easier. Uh, it says, the fat was sizzling and spitting in the saucepan. Now, of course, sizzling and spitting, ah, yes, it was salt river that had hyperbole, right, sorry. Yes, uh, somebody says alliteration. We're going to get a better example of alliteration. It is that. But what else could this be? Can you hear that, that sound, sizzle, spit? It sounds a bit like the fat in the pan, so that is an onomatopoeia. Okay? 
because it's an imitation of the sound itself. Okay, good. And number four, the, the context would be that somebody has said, have you got a date with that girl? And he answers, I wouldn't go out with such a little Jezebel. Now what figure of speech is that? I'll give you a hint. He's assuming that everybody knows Jezebel. Okay, dog say your hands up. Let's see it. Illusion. Yes, he's alluding to Jezebel in the Bible. Very good. Number five is rather silly, but <laughs> uh, funny. Let's see if, uh, if you can tell us. Why did the beetroot blush? Because it saw the salad dressing. And my hint, my tip is that that word dressing has two meanings. So what is this? Salt River. Write something. If we say it saw the salad dressing, pun, excellent, that's quite right. This is a pun. Good. So, uh, number six is a definition, not an example. A form of expression natural to a language or a group of people, but whose meaning may not be clear from a literal interpretation of the words. What is that? Um, Doxa, go ahead. Idiom, that's an idiom. It's a definition of an idiom. Right, as we said, we had uh, the cherry on top and things like that in the example. Good. Seven, this is a beautiful poem by Dylan Thomas in My Craft or Southern Art. And in it he says, and the lovers lie abed with all their griefs in their arms. What's he doing here? What, what figure of speech is that? I think it's Salt River's turn or Worcester. Worcester, how about you? Can you see what that is? Um, these lovers are in bed. They have their lovers in their arms. But he says, with all their griefs in their arms. Because sadly enough in life, sometimes your greatest source of joy can be your greatest source of sorrow too. Anyone? No? Okay, that is a very good example of a personification. Because he is saying that you can hold your grief in your arms as if it were a human being, as if it were your lover. Okay? Good. Uh, the next one, number eight. He was huge and looked frightening, but he was actually as gentle as a lamb. And as soon as you see that as, as, yes, Doxa, what is it? Then you know it is a simile. Very good, a simile. And spell simile with an E at the end, not an I. -E. You know that. Okay, yes, good, good, good. Let's uh, just show you that. Uh, no problem. Oh, and I spelt it as two words, so there you are. Join the club. <laughs> okay, number nine. Uh, Jared Manley Hopkins loved this figure of speech, and in his poem, Invisnet, he's appealing to us not to over-cultivate nature. And he says, oh, let them be left, wildness and the wet. Long live the weeds and the wilderness yet. So, I told you we'd be getting a better example of that later on, and what is it? Uh, anybody? Uh, Saltrava, can you tell me what is, look at that, wildness, wet, weeds and wilderness. Great, that's our better example of alliteration, quite right. Um, very well done, everybody. I hope you've been you've had enough um, input now to see how urgent it is for you to start studying. Go and work hard at that unit one. Learn all your literary devices and study your poetry by going to all three of those sources. Okay. Any questions before we close?
close and we'll meet again in two weeks time. If you have a question, either raise your hand or type it quickly. Okay, well then it uh, just uh, remains for me to say um, it's very nice to have you on board and if you want to email me, please don't use my cornerstone email because I'm afraid I'm not very good at checking that one. So here is my, my personal email address and it is available on the Funda uh, study guide as well and I think on, uh, especially in the syllabus or module outline, mailstain at gmail.com. If you have a problem, if something's worrying you, you don't understand, then please write me a note and I'll see if I can help you. Great. Enjoy your studies. Thanks for being here. Bye-bye.